Hello, and thank you for looking at this video. I hope you'll find it interesting, perhaps sometimes amazing, and also enjoyable. This is a story which is all about tremendous success, enormous achievement, and the creation of astounding wealth. It's also all about one family's amazing lifestyles and profligate spending, which I'm confident was well beyond anything anyone looking at this video has ever or will ever experience. Unless perhaps you're lucky enough to win the maximum Euro million prize of 190 million euros at least 10 times. Woolworths was without doubt the biggest retail business has ever been. At its height, it created riches which enabled its founder to build the tallest building in the world and to pay for that in cash. It was the first business to be truly global, with at one time more than 5,000 almost identical stores spread throughout the world. However, Woolworths faded into relatively peaceful retirement and closure in the USA and Canada in the mid-1990s, before falling like a stone in Great Britain, when it went from normal trading with 807 stores to complete close down in only 41 days, with the last store closing on the 6th of January 2009. This was the headquarters of the British Woolworth Company on the Marylebone Road in London. At the height of the Woolworth business in Great Britain in the late 1950s and through to the early 1970s, there were 1,140 Woolworth stores in Great Britain employing approximately 38,000 people. And then, when the business collapsed, 27,000 employees lost their jobs. This is Brigitte in Leeds. Woolworths is on the right, halfway up the street with white sun blinds. In 1956, it was decided to modernise and extend this door to create what was to be for some years the largest Woolworths in Great Britain. My story started one year later in 1957, when I joined Woolworths at this store as a 17-year-old trainee manager, just as the new renovations and extensions were about to start. I'm sure that most of you will remember those old, tall, dark mahogany counters, which were usual in the 1950s and 1960s. In those days, training managers were expected to work ridiculously long hours, just as a normal part of the job. But during renovations, we frequently had to work more than 100 hours a week, with no overtime payments, when even back in those days, it was illegal for anyone under 18 to work more than 48 hours a week. On one occasion, after arriving at the store at the usual time of 7 o'clock in the morning, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was informed that, as the area superintendent was visiting the following day to carry out an inspection, I was required to work all night cleaning the newly installed terrazzo floor with a newly delivered mechanical scrubbing machine. I left at 8 o'clock the next morning, having worked 25 hours, almost without a break, and I remember I had to be woken up by the bus conductor on my way home. This is the same store in 1959 after the renovations were completed. And, as I mentioned earlier, for some years this store at Leeds was the largest Woolies in Great Britain. This is a photo also taken in 1959, and I remember the store almost always being packed with customers, and Saturdays it was almost impossible to move in the crush. Christmas was always an absolute nightmare. I also remember two of us armed only with one baseball bat between us, taking a taxi to the bank every day, and we carried bags containing anything from £5,000 to £20,000 or more, depending on the previous day's takings. £1,000 in 1958 would be worth about £19,400 today. So, we were carrying the equivalent of between 90,000 
and £360,000 in today's money, and the only precaution we took was to occasionally change the time of the taxi. As I mentioned earlier, trainee managers were expected to work ridiculously long hours, but they also had a very big incentive to work so hard because, in those days, Woolworth managers were, without doubt, the highest paid employed people in town. Most of the older established managers were on contracts agreed before the war, which provided them with tremendous salaries in the 1950s and 60s. This was the management team at the Leeds store in 1958. Some of you may recognise a handsome chap still with some hair on the right end of the back row. I very well remember the general manager, Roy Barwell. He's at the centre of the front row in this picture. He was a very tall, silver-haired, elegant man, but he was also quite a fearsome boss. Roy Barwell had a lovely powder blue convertible Austin Atlantic like this one, which he was able to park in his private garage at the store. He also owned a Rover P4 saloon, which his wife and daughter shared. I remember him buying a mansion at Roundy Park in Leeds in 1958, for which he paid £38,000. The equivalent value today would be around £840,000. I also recall the manager of the Halifax store, which was just a small store in a small town, having a chauffeur-driven Bentley, simply because he'd never bothered to learn to drive. So, we all worked our socks off, hoping to achieve something similar. Of course, it was all an illusion. We soon discovered that newly promoted managers were on nothing like the same sort of salary contracts as those who had been employed before the war. I stuck it out for five years, and I eventually left Woolworths in 1962. Unfortunately, the flagship Leeds store suffered horrendous fire in 1969, which completely gutted the whole building, so it needed a total rebuild only ten years after having been modernised and extended. So now let us talk about the creation of the Woolworth business. This is young Frank Winfield Woolworth on the right, together with his younger brother, Charles Sumner Woolworth. His father, John Hubble Woolworth, had been a captain in the Unionist Army in the American Civil War. On his return from the war, he married Fanny McBriar, who was the daughter of Irish immigrants and John and Fanny scraped together enough money to buy a small farm in Watertown, New York State. As their two sons grew up, it was of course expected that they would eventually run the farm. However, Frank left school at age 15, and he was immediately attracted to the retail business. He applied for a job at several local stores, but he was rejected by all of them. So. He asked his parents for a small loan, and after working on the farm all day, he rode on the farm horse in the evenings to attend classes at the local college in Watertown, taking a night school course in bookkeeping. Frank eventually managed to obtain a job in a general store called Augsbury and Moore in Watertown. He turned up for his interview with William Moore, unable to afford a suit and not even wearing a tie but he offered to work for three months unpaid whilst he learned the job in exchange only for his board and lodgings. So Moore then offered Frank a six-month apprenticeship and agreed to pay him $3.50 a week from the fourth month. In those days, stores didn't have a display area, so when customers entered the store, they went to the counter and asked the salesperson for whatever it was they wanted to buy. They also had to barter to negotiate the best price. After working there for a few years, Frank persuaded his employers to try displaying everything on tables with prices clearly displayed in a new store which they opened in 1877. 
Unfortunately, it turned out to be in a poor location. And despite Frank working very hard to prove his point, that store failed after only three months. Nevertheless, Frank was absolutely convinced he had the right ideas for a successful store. So he persuaded his boss, William Moore, to lend him $300. And with that, together with his own meagre savings, he opened his first shop in Utica, New York State in 1878. However, again, it only had limited success and was eventually closed. But nevertheless, Frank was able to repay his debt in full to his former boss. A year later, in 1879, and at the age of 27, Frank again managed to raise, raise sufficient cash to enable him to open another five and ten cent store, this time in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And after counting the first day's takings of $85.65, he immediately brought his brother, son, into the business. This is the very first store in Lancaster with Frank and Sum in the doorway. And as you can see, it was called Woolworth's Five and Ten Cent Store. Only two weeks later, Frank opened his second store 60 miles down the road in Harrisburg and appointed his brother as the manager. This is one of the earliest stores after Frank had uh, made his brother Sum his partner. So they were now called Woolworth Brothers. During the following years, Frank and Sum worked very hard together. And between them, they developed five different chains of stores in a sort of franchise from the original store. Then, in 1912, 33 years after opening the first store, the F.W. Woolworth Company was incorporated in America with 586 stores all of them under the leadership of Frank Woolworth. The stock exchange flotation raised more than $65 million. That's around $1,630,000,000 in today's money. And half of it went to Frank. Three years earlier, in 1909, Frank had decided to extend his empire across the Atlantic to Britain. After touring around England, he chose the bustling seaport of Liverpool to open his first of many stores because he was impressed by its thriving industry, by its civic pride, and by the grandeur of its public buildings. It was a huge undertaking for Frank and his team because not only had they to locate suitable sites for new stores and develop those in the Woolworth image, but they also had to employ and train staff and by far the biggest job was to organize sources of supply for the new stores. Everything on display was to be priced at a maximum of six pence. This was the grand staircase leading to the upper sales floor at Liverpool. And it was a rather splendid building which had previously been an exclusive millinery shop. This was a section of the displays where every item was for sale for just one penny. This was another part area showing goods for sale at three pence. And this was a Staffordshire china and pottery display. This was the tea room at Liverpool. So you can see that Frank Worth intended that his stores should be something quite special and extremely attractive to his customers. So, only five months after sailing from New York, Frank Woolworth and his team opened the first store in England in November 1909 at Church Street, Liverpool, with a preview day. This was a report in the Liverpool Daily Post and Mercury, dated the 6th of November 1909. Many thousands of people yesterday afternoon and evening availed themselves of the opportunity afforded by the proprietors Messrs F. W. Woolworth & Company Limited of inspecting their new store at Church Street. The handsome premises were thronged the whole time they were open, many no doubt attracted by the novel character 
of the business. Six pence is the highest price charge for any single article in this establishment, but the variety of articles is infinite. Though none were on sale at the preview day, the goods were laid out ready for the commencement of business and occasioned the visitors considerable surprise in the matter of their exceptional value. A full orchestra and a brass band were engaged in discoursing music and the crowds were entertained by circus acts and fireworks. There was a constant run on the tea room where the proprietor supplied free teas to all who were fortunate enough to reach the room through the crush. The Daily Mail reporter didn't bother to visit the store on the preview day, but instead he went on the opening day and his report was far less enthusiastic. He said he found himself crushed in the throng of more than 60,000 customers trying to squeeze into the store and witnessed huge queues at the tills. He concluded that Woolworths was a circus, just like the one run by Phineas Barnum, and that the proprietor had only chosen Liverpool so that he could skedaddle back to New York when things went wrong, leaving all of his debts behind him. Within only two months, a further 12 Woolworths stores opened in the north of England, and later more were opened in the London area, starting with one in the then affluent suburb of Brixton in December 1910. Unfortunately, that same Brixton store was only 12 months from celebrating its 100th anniversary when it was closed in January 2009. This picture shows a store in Holborn in 1920 when a new Woolworths store was being opened on average every 17 days throughout the United Kingdom. By 1934, they were opening a new store every five days. In 1910, a year after opening his first store in Great Britain, Frank Woolworth commenced his grandest venture when he commissioned the design and construction of the Woolworth Building at number 233 Broadway, New York City. When completed in 1912, the building was 800 feet or 244 meters tall. The cost was $13.5 million, which would have been around $340 million in today's money, and Frank paid for it in cash. In fact, he bought the bank that provided the initial funding for the building. Three years later, in 1917, the American Woolworths opened its 1,000th store in palatial premises on New York's Fifth Avenue. The Woolworths building was the tallest building in the world and remained so for 18 years until 1930 when it was overtaken by the Chrysler building. It is still one of the 30 tallest buildings in New York City. Just as a little comparison, the Woolworth building built in 1913 has 60 floors and is almost 800 feet tall. The Trump Tower, built 70 years later, has only 58 stories and is only 650 feet tall. So perhaps Donald isn't quite as big as he thinks he is. The Woolworth building stood in the shadow of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center and it was a familiar feature in many photos comparing the old with the new. This is the Woolworth building shown in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center when both of the towers had collapsed. It had to be closed for several weeks, but this is the brightly illuminated penthouse, penthouse apartment at the top of the Woolworth building, simply indicating defiance in the face of the enemy. Today, the building houses many diverse businesses and even a university, and the top floors now consist mainly of rather expensive and exclusive apartments. The penthouse apartment at the top, which is shown here, has seven floors and a price tag 
of $120 million. That is the highest price ever asked for any apartment in downtown Manhattan. One very sad event in the history of war was, was that on the 25th of November 1944, a German V-2 rocket fell on a packed Woolworths store in New Cross Road, London, killing 168 people and injuring 122 others. That was the largest single civilian loss of life due to enemy action in Britain during the entire World War II conflict. Now let us move on to some tales and stories about the Woolworth family. This is Frank and Jenny, as they were at the time of their greatest success. It was said that after Frank left school, he worked every single day of his life. Frank and Jenny had three daughters, Helena, the eldest in the middle, Edna on the left, and the youngest, Jessie May, on the right. Edna was by all accounts a beautiful young woman, and she married a chap called Franklin Laws Hutton. Franklin, together with his brother, Edward, had a very successful New York stock brokerage company and an investment bank. He was also a man with a dreadful reputation with women, and he was a notorious philanderer. Sadly, it turned out to be a loveless marriage. And Edna committed suicide from an overdose, apparently in despair at her unhappy life, in 1918, only six years after the birth of her daughter Barbara. Even sadder, it was a six-year-old Barbara who first found her mother's lifeless body in bed. This was when the press first dubbed her Poor Little Rich Girl, which was a description which dogged her for the rest of her life. Following the death of her mother, Barbara was pretty much abandoned by her father, and so she went to live with her grandparents at the highly opulent Winfield Hall on Long Island. Frank had decided to spend some of his well-earned money, and in 1913 he built this palatial home at a cost of $9 million, which was an absurd sum for a home in those days. Just compare it to the $13.5 million cost of the colossal 60-storey Woolworth building. Unfortunately, Frank died only three years later in 1919 at the age of 66 from a tooth infection because he was petrified of visiting the dentist. When he died, he was worth around $90 million, which in today's values would be approximately $1 billion $120 million. Frank died only one year after Barbara went to live there, and Barbara's grandmother, Jenny, was by then suffering from dementia, and she sadly passed away only two years after Frank died. Frank's brother, Sam Woolworth, continued to work very successfully in the business, but he died peacefully in his sleep in 1947, aged 90. So, on to the main character of our story. Barbara Woolworth Hutton was born in 1912 and died in 1979, aged 65. That was only around 40 years ago. After her grandmother and grandfather died, Barbara went to live with various relatives and was raised by an assortment of governesses. Her closest friend as she grew up was a cousin who was the son of Aunt Jessie May, who was Barbara's youngest aunt. He was James Paul Donahue, and he became infamous as Jimmy Donahue. I'll reveal some sordid details about Jimmy's life a little later. Barbara grew up amongst the most fantastic wealth and privilege, and amongst the greatest celebrities of that time. For some years, she lived with an older cousin called Dinah Merrill, who was a well-known film actress. Dinah's father was Edward Hutton, the brother of the unpleasant Franklin Hutton, and he had married the general food cereals heiress Marjorie Merriweather Post, who at the time was believed to be the wealthiest woman in the world, with a personal fortune exceeding $250 million. 
Dinah's first husband was Stanley Rumbo, who inherited the massive Colgate Palmolive fortune. Her second husband was Academy Award winning film star Cliff Robertson, and her third husband was Ted Hartley, who was the Chief Executive Officer of the RKO Pictures Corporation. Despite her enormous wealth, Dinah Merrill seems to have been a nice person who was well respected, and she probably did her best to bring up a normal family and also did her best for Barbara. Dinah died as recently as 2017, aged 93, leaving a fortune worth a massive $5 billion. When she was only 15 years old, Barbara had her own apartment in New York. She was again dubbed as a poor little rich girl when, right in the middle of the Great Depression in 1930, but in keeping with New York society's high society's traditions, she was given an extremely lavish debutante ball for her 18th birthday. It lasted over three days, and among the 1,000 guests were, of course, the Astors, the Rockefellers, and the Vanderbilt. They were all entertained by some of the greatest stars of the day, including Rudy Valley and Maurice Chevalier. Following that ball, public condemnation and criticism and the onslaught from newspapers was so severe that Barbara was sent by her family on an extended tour of Europe to escape it all. During that tour, as a debutante from America, she was presented to King George and Queen Mary at Buckingham Palace. By the time she was 18, her inheritance from her grandparents had grown to a massive $150 million. She had already inherited more than $50 million from her mother, and later, of course, a very large inheritance from her father's estate. And so, in today's money, the total she inherited would have been approximately $2.9 billion. She'd had a childhood marked by the suicide of her mother when she was only six years old, and the neglect of her father, setting the stage for a life of difficulty forming lasting relationships. She was married and divorced seven times and had many affairs. Barbara Hutton acquired many different and very substantial properties. This was Hartford Villa in Regent's Park, London, which had been owned by the Marquis of Hartford and which she bought after it had suffered a major fire. She had it completely rebuilt and named it Winfield House in memory of her grandfather, Frank Winfield Woolworth. In London, only Buckingham Palace has larger grounds and gardens than Winfield House. During World War II, part of Winfield was used as the headquarters of an RAF barrage balloon outfit and also as an officers' club. Between February 1951 and June 1952, it was the rented home of the comedian Arthur Askey. Barbara Hutton eventually sold Winfield House to the American government in 1955 for only $1. When it became, and still is today, the USA Ambassador's official residence. This was a 10 bedroom, 7 floor mansion she owned in New York. This is the entrance hall and grand staircase. This is the main lounge. And this mansion was recently sold for $90 million. She owned many other very substantial houses. We'll return to Barbara, but for now let us talk about her cousin, Jimmy Donahue. Jimmy was the son of Barbara's youngest aunt, Jessie May. His father was of Irish descent, and he had made a fortune in the fat rendering business. Jimmy Donahue, together with Barbara Hutton, inherited most of the Woolworth estate, and he also eventually inherited his father's very substantial fortune. He also grew up to have notorious drug, alcohol, and relationship problems. Despite being well, very well known as a prolific homosexual, who had many affairs, he was most notorious for his long affair with 
Wallace Simpson, the Duchess of Windsor. Jimmy first met the Duchess at the Palm Beach Palace Hotel in Florida, which was his home at the time. He spent most of his life living in various opulent hotels. He was 25 and she was 44. After making friends with the Duke and Duchess, he decided to join them as they set sail on the Queen Mary liner from New York to Cherbourg on the 24th of May, 1950. The Duchess and Jimmy started the voyage across the Atlantic as new friends, but almost certainly ended it as lovers. For the next four years, they were inseparable, as the ageing Duke had to pay the tormented cuckold. Most of Jimmy's friends refused to believe that he could ever have a sexual relationship with a woman. But Jimmy certainly did with the Duchess. When they were in Paris, the Duchess would go out with the Duke and Jimmy as a threesome. But the Duke, tiring of long hours spent in nightclubs, would go home at midnight. The Duchess and Jimmy would then frequently go on to an apartment owned by the Count Jean de Baglion, which overlooked the River Seine, and her car would not return to her home until later the following day. Narl Coward was reputed to have said to his friend Truman Capote, when talking about the Duchess's affair with the homosexual Jimmy, that she married a king, but now she's screwing a queen. Anyway, after four years, Jimmy was getting bored. There was a big row, and finally the tiny duke gathered up enough courage to shout, We've had enough of you, Jimmy. Get out! Unfortunately for the Windsors, that meant goodbye to a large slice of the high life, because during the length of the affair, Woolworth Money had bankrolled the couple, who'd caved into the onslaught of money, gifts, holidays, cars, foreign travel and jewellery, which Jimmy and his mother, Jessie May, had showered on them. Jimmy went back to the life he'd known before, once again queening it around those Fifth Avenue bars reserved for New York's upper crust gay set. Jimmy died from a drugs overdose in 1966, aged only 51. So now we return to Barbara and times when she began to acquire husbands and the most magnificent pieces of jewellery. Husband number one was Alexis Midivani. Barbara was first married at age 21 to this self-styled Georgian prince who was the son of General Zachary Midivani. The Midivani family had fled from Georgia in 1921 when it was invaded by the Soviets. All five of the Midivani children managed to invent titles for themselves and also to marry very wealthy partners. And their father, General Midivani, often quipped that he was the only prince ever to have inherited his title from his children. In this photo with Midivani, Barbara is wearing what became the most famous Cartier jade bead necklace in the world. We will return to that necklace in a minute. Barbara's marriage to Midivani lasted only for two years, and this was pretty much to set the course for all of her following marriages. They divorced in 1935, and in the divorce settlement, Midivani received $2 million dollars, that's 36 million in today's values, as well as this very nice convertible Rolls Royce, in which he crashed and was killed a couple of years later when he was only 28 years old. This was Barbara's sister-in-law, Nina Conan Doyle, the self-styled Princess Midivani. Together with her husband, Dennis Conan Doyle, who was a son of the very wealthy Sherlock Holmes author, Arthur Conan Doyle. Nina and Barbara became good friends, and Nina would often accompany Barbara on the shopping trips to the top jewellers. And her game was to play one for you and two for me, which Barbara was happy to oblige, as it was all good fun, and it was only money. 
and as they say, it all stayed in the family. Many jewels have appeared for sale at various auctions of having originally been owned by Barbara Hutton, which have been given as gifts to Nina Midvani. Nina died in London in 1987, and that beautiful piece of jewellery, the Hutton Midivani Jade Necklace, was found under her bed. It was sold at Sotheby's Hong Kong auction in 1988, so one year after Nina's death, for £21 million. At the same Hong Kong auction, what had been Barbara's Jade Bangle was sold for £3,700,000. These are some more examples of Barbara's fabulous collection of jewels. This was one of her most famous pieces, which was originally an emerald and diamond bracelet that once belonged to Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, that Barbara had remade into this tiara. I hate to think what that ring on her finger may be worth. This is part of the Romanov Emerald Collection, which Barbara purchased for a reported $1 million. They were previously owned by the Grand Duchess Vladimir of Russia. And she was another lady who loved to wear her jewellery. Now we come to husband number two. In 1935, only one day after a divorce from Midivani, Barbara married this chap, Count Kurt Heinrich Reventlau. He was a Danish count. Reventlau was an unpleasant character who was quite sadistically violent, and he dominated Barbara throughout their marriage with verbal and physical abuse, which escalated once to a savage beating that left her with a short stay in hospital and put him for a short stay in jail. Reventlau was the father of Barbara's only child, Lawrence, who was always known just as Lance Reventlau. Barbara and Reventlau were married for just three years. Lance became quite a successful racing car designer and driver. He designed and had built this car, the Scarab, this car was very successful in many races, often beating the more famous Lister Jaguars. In 1955, Lance and his good friend James Dean were driving in separate cars on their way to the Salinas sports car racing circuit. They stopped at the garage to have a cup of coffee together. This was a photo Lance took of James Dean at the garage only 30 minutes before Dean was killed in a high-speed head-on collision. Lance was a highly experienced pilot with thousands of hours of piloting various aircraft, but on the 24th of July 1972 he was a passenger in a plane when he was viewing possible ski sites he wanted to develop at Aspen, Colorado, and unfortunately the pilot was relatively inexperienced and he stalled the aircraft whilst trying to make a turn plane plunged to the ground, killing all on board. Back to Barbara. As World War II threatened, she moved from London to Hollywood, and in 1942 she met and married Cary Grant, one of the biggest movie stars of the day. The married couple were immediately dubbed by the press as Cash and Carrie. Their marriage lasted almost four years, and they parted in 1945. Unlike with most of her past husbands, she managed to they managed to remain good friends. Husband number four was Prince Igor Trubetskoy. He was a Russian prince of limited means, but world-renowned as a racing car driver. She married him in 1947. That same year, he was the driver of the very first Ferrari ever to compete in a Grand Prix motor race in the Monaco Grand Prix. They divorced in 1951. Husband number five was Porfirio Rubirosa. He was an absolute scoundrel and rogue. 
In a scathing review of the marriage ceremony in the Millwalty Sentinel, Phyllis Battelle, who was a very famous society reporter, coined the oft-quoted phrase, the bride for her fifth wedding wore black and carried a scotch and soda. Barbarossa had previously been married to Hutton's arch rival in the wealth and marriage stakes, American tobacco company heiress Doris Duke. During Doris Duke's one-year marriage to Rubirosa, she gave him various sports cars, polo ponies, a plantation in his native Dominican Republic, a B-25 bomber which had been converted into a luxurious private aircraft, a fishing fleet based off the coast of Africa, and a 17th century home in Rue de Bellechasse in Paris. She had previously given his former wife, French film star Danielle Darieux, one million dollars to agree to an uncontested divorce. Doris Duke and Ruby Rosa were married for just one year. Ruby Rosa was a notorious international playboy. He apparently had remarkable physical attributes as well. In New York's restaurants at that time, it was usual when requesting the very large 15-inch pepper grinder to say, please pass me the Ruberosa. His marriage to Barbara lasted only 53 days from December the 30th, 1953 to February the 20th, 1954. He openly continued his affair with actress Zsa, Zsa Gabor all the way through this short marriage. So, in approximately a total of one year and two months of marriage to two of the wealthiest women in the world, in addition to what he'd already acquired from Doris Duke, he received $2.5 million and yet another luxuriously converted B-25 bomber in his divorce settlement from Barbara. Unbelievable. Ruberosa died in 1965, aged 56, when he crashed his Ferrari into a horse chestnut tree in the Bois de Boulogne after an all-night drinking session at Jimmy's nightclub in Paris, where he'd been celebrating being on the winning team in the Polo Coup de France. Barbara then went on to have various affairs and the lavish spending continued un unabated. Husband number six in 1955, was Baron Gottfried von Kram. He was a German tennis star. This marriage also ended in divorce in 1959. He also died in an automobile crash, this time near Cairo, and, so far, three of Barbara's past husbands have perished in car crashes. The last of Barbara Hutton's husbands was husband number seven, a chap called Raymond Doan who was just a chemist working for a French oil company in Morocco. Not wishing to be married to a nobody, Barbara bought him an Indo-Chinese princedom from the Laotian embassy in Rabat, and so he became Prince Raymond Doan Vinnachampasak. This marriage, too, was short-lived, lasting only two years from 1964 to 1966. By this time, Barbara was in a downward spiral and her daily diet consisted of bottles of Coca-Cola with vodka as well as amphetamines, many cigarettes and cocktails of various drugs. Her erratic spending habits only increased. She showered friends, acquaintances and even strangers with gifts and money simply to gain their affections. She lost millions in fees for bad financial advice and poor fund management. As the once overflowing pot of gold was dwindling and as she verged on bankruptcy, she began liquidating assets in order to make ends meet. This is one of the last pictures taken of her before she died when she had to be carried by a chauffeur. It really is such a sad story because she was such an attractive lady but she simply could not cope with all the wealth which she inherited. And these pictures indicate what an attractive woman she was. 
And so, with all of her properties gone, and with few possessions other than some remaining jewellery, Barbara lived out her final years in a Los Angeles hotel until she died of a heart attack in 1979 at the age of 66, only six years after the death of her son, Lance. At the time of her death, she still had some jewellery, but it was believed that she only had a measly $3,500 in a bank account. Possibly, the main feature of Barbara's life was that despite all of the money she inherited, she never really found any happiness. The divorce was not yet complete. She went to a grave as the Princess Raymond Doan Vinachambasak, in other words, the wife of a nobody. She was buried in the quite over-the-top Woolworth Mausoleum, which had been built in the form of an Egyptian temple at the Woodlawn Cemetery at Bronx County, New York, to lie alongside her grandfather, Frank Winfield Woolworth, her grandmother, Jenny, and the ashes of her son, Lance. Thank you for looking at this presentation, which I sincerely hope you enjoyed.